my name is Ms. Vedetta Maria Drosos. I'm uh, from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I am Director of Operations at St. John the Compassionate Mission, which is an Orthodox Urban Outreach in located in Toronto. And I have the uh, honor and pr privilege to introduce our two next speakers. They were kind enough to do the coin toss in the hallway. So Christina one, she'll be going first, and George will be going second. If I can introduce Maria Christina Sheen Reinen. Her education includes studies in education, theology, and counseling psychology. She graduated with a bachelor's from Helena College with a double major in education and theology. At St. Vladimir's, she earned a master's in theology at the University of Massachusetts and received a master's in education and rehabilitation counseling and went on to earn certification in alcohol and drug addiction counseling in the states of Massachusetts and California. She has taught emotionally traumatized and learning disabled children in Boston public schools, counseled alcoholics, their families and spouses, teaching education groups on addictions and how it affects the family. She has experience in outpatient and inpatient counseling. It's an honor and pleasure to have them present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank God for this opportunity to be here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and St. Catherine's Vision, Father Tom and Kula, Fitzgerald, my family, and you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ is in our midst. He is Could you please turn to your closest neighbor and extend your hand and the greeting, Christ is in our midst. I always love every opportunity to be able to do that because we're two or three are gathered, right? He's in our midst. And often, especially today in 2014, we are so caught up in what we're doing and can be scattered in so many ways or focused, but we tend and can in all of that forget that we are not alone, that God is with us, and he's continually revealing himself to us in all the ways people and circumstances that he provides for us and that we freely choose to enter. So Christ is in our midst is an affirmation of the kingdom of God in our presence and also an affirmation of who we are, the grace, the divine compassion, and the mercy that gushes forth from the body, the body of Christ, the believers, from God to us. We are all called here today because of God's divine compassion and mercy, because God loves us, and because the people who gathered us here love us. That's why we're here today. So there should be joy and thanksgiving in that knowledge, and I'd just like to start that way. Being loved, being the children of the King, peace himself being present so that we can have, as St. John the Evangelist says, life in abundance. Because Christ himself desires a deep and intimate relationship with us and does not abandon us. So the topic that Dr. George Stavros and I are talking about today and showing forth the divine compassion and mercy of God is healing relationships. So it is fitting to start out understanding that we were created out of love, out of relationship uniquely, and then born into a relationship between persons who love and desire to love, however difficult, however wonderful that is, and that in our brokenness and in our sin, we are born again into a relationship, which is the church. So the love and the healing comes out of that relationship and not in isolation. That's the truth of our lives. So I ask you to extend the greeting to one another as an affirmation, and especially to put that forward as that knowledge of truth. Being here at this conference and being with you and speaking on this topic reminds me of St. Peter when uh, they were at the Lord's Transfiguration and he says, it is good for us to be here. We, we want the Pascha, we want the resurrection, we want the joy and the love and the kinonia of relationship. And of course the Lord provides that, that on this side until he comes again, there's also his cross. And we as Christians, that's emblazoned in our hearts, oiled on our bodies and prayed over us in the divine services, the cross of the Lord, as we hear so clearly in so many prayers and in the canon to the cross, but also we hear at Matins after we venerate the gospel or as we're venerating the gospel, the chanter reads 
for low Blue Cross joys coming to the world. And for our intents and purposes today, our relationships are our joy and pasta, and they are our crosses. But today, let it be pasta for you. Let it be here, where it's been given in abundance, the gifts of the body here, present in this conference for you to be nourished and take with you to bring to the cross experiences. And that's what we have to do every day, is to take the food that's given and eat and thank God and enjoy it for the strength that comes next. That's the good news for today. And as Metropolitan Colleagues were so eloquently and with love said, that God not only suffers with us, but he's already healing it. He's already healing the suffering. For the Orthodox Church, we understand that begins with our baptism, where we die to our old man and we're raised again. At baptism, we experience our first public moment of repentance, where we enter into baptism, the healing mystery of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and there we discern and celebrate the healing of all of our wounds and all of our wounded relationships. All the mysteries of life in Christ are healing, sanctifying, requiring our cooperation. Working with God through these sacraments and sacramentals reveals not only his desire for us, but in turn, by our amen, reveal our desire for him, showing not only our faith in him, but his faith in us, that he would not force himself on us, would not make himself be in relationship with us, but would gently show himself to us. In the both now endeavor hymn to the Theotokos, let us sing the praises of Mary, door of heaven, sprung forth from man. She's one of us. We know that as Orthodox. We hold that close, dear to our hearts. We know her reverence and her place. But she did usher in the kingdom, the hymn says. She ushered in the kingdom by her amen and her cooperation in bringing forth the Savior, same for us, that we are to bring forth the Savior. And her pain in his cross is also our pain. But in that, the hymn goes on to say, be bold, be bold, ye people of God, for the Lord who is all powerful has vanquished all our enemies. Beautiful. God has taken care of it. He's poured out his divine compassion and mercy in community, in relationship, and not without our assent. As it says in the book of Revelations, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him, and be, he will be with me. The mercy and compassion, the healing, is not forced upon us. And oftentimes, in the midst of the need for healing, we are not able to enter into that because it is not forced. Because we are provided with what we need at the time. That is not to say that we are always to stay in the relationships that are given us, that are wrong, that aren't working. It is to say that that is a possibility for repentance. Those occasions, those relationships, for healing. God waits for us to say yes before he goes forward. We have free will. We choose to enter in the relationships we have in our lives, and hopefully they do too. Where we are called by our baptism and chrismation to take the kingdom by force and to will ourselves to love those that are given to us. And that can be a very painful reality for us, requiring brutal honesty. And that brutal honesty can only come from living a life in Christ by attending the services, by going to confession, by seeking the spiritual counsel of the spiritual father and the spiritual mother and the community that loves us and knows us best, that we are able to not live by our own understanding, but to live by the truth that's being given to us and revealed to us in the other, in the community, in God. That does not happen alone or in isolation. That only happens by grace. That only happens by relationship. In Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon and 12-step programs, there is much healing. And I have had a lot of background in that. And I'm grateful for the healing that God has provided for me through those programs. 
because God has given me the kingdom now until he comes again in the church. And that healing he brought through those relationships as well. His mercy and compassion extended in the church, I the church, in the group, the church in the group, the relationship. Those programs, for many who suffer with the addiction to alcohol, the addiction to sex, the addiction to gambling, the addiction to work, the addiction to food, are striving to live out our relationships as honestly as we can in our brokenness, but are unable to see or feel or know the healing because we are choosing to go outside of ourselves, and the church teaches us to go in. We start in. We start with God first. I have to know who I am in God. And when I can keep vigil with that, then I can honestly seek to know the other in relationship. But if I am struggling in ways that I can't see clearly the truth, I can't see clearly you. And so the relationships are more pained, and the divine compassion isn't clear. But rather, I am in the way of the divine compassion. I am not cooperating. So the church says, what, how do we heal that? Again, it's very simple. Everyone knows this. That's why you're here today. Say your prayers, fast, read your scriptures, do your almsgiving, and in these good things, the fruit will come. But the fruit is to really bear the crosses that are given, bear the relationships, bear the staying up all night, bear the brokenness of a marriage, bear the pain of the death of a child, bear the loss of a job, knowing that that is not the end while it is the end of reality as we understand and know it, it is and can be a beginning. It's a depth to an understanding of reality, but the truth will come through that. God brings us to the resurrection. Matthews Weber says, so many of us are preoccupied with the past, which brings us depression. You know, I wish I had taken that extra course, then I would have finished on time, and I should have said yes when he asked me to marry him. Look where I am now. Um, I shouldn't have had children because I don't know what I'm doing. When we live there, we're, we can be depressed and we have a lot of grief that's not godly grief. And he also goes on to say that many of us are caught up in the anxiety of what tomorrow will bring. You know, I don't have control over tomorrow. I can make my plan and let God do his work. It's my business to commend it to God and not to live in fear of the future or try to live there because God is in the present and the healing is in the present. The healing's in the past and the healing's in the future, but I'm in the present, and I can't attend to the present if I'm in the past and I'm striving for the future now. Now is where the healing is. To fight against the temptation for doubting the present and wishing to be in the past and for dreading the future. This is the moment of grace that helps us to heal our relationships at home, at work, and in the community. Because living in the present, we can attend what's really happening rather than what we want to happen, what we expect to happen, and what we hope to happen. And while those are not bad in and of themselves, if what I hope for, what I expect, and what I want are not in keeping with what's really happening, where are we? We're lost in our own denial, and God is still working through that. We're lost in our own fear, and we're unable to acquire and enter into the divine mercy the way that God intends for us to do. So in the beginning, in our prayer, the denial needs to be broken. And God does not break it like a hammer smashing the glass. Gently and beautifully in the relationships, the people that we don't like, the jobs that are difficult, the neighbor that drives us nuts, the daughter that brings us love, the boss that is compassionate, all those things help to break the denial. The denial and the healing come when we accept that we are forgiven, accept our baptism, and desire to forgive the other. So the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, as Maletius Weber says, needs to be our every breath and our every heartbeat. This is the teaching of the church. And that only comes by grace. But in that, we break with the past, let go of the future and stay in the present. In that prayer, we have the tools to be able to stay in the present. 
And in that truth, may we be able to see our own sins. So that in communion with God, we can begin using, enjoying, sharing, and extending his divine mercy and compassion to others because now we are experiencing that divine compassion and mercy. The healing also comes with the breaking of the denial to fight against the evil. We have to see clearly what is good and what is not good because we are fighting against the evil one who today, in every way, is distracting and trying in every way to keep us from seeing the pre- being in the present and seeing the truth. So the question is, how do we cultivate that healing at home? How do we cultivate it at work and in the community by being present to the present? We have to understand in relationship with the church and with God, what are those things that are standing in the way of me being able to cultivate the present? saying the prayers. You know, it's one thing to say the church says, do your rule of prayer. But it's, it's also another thing to say, I gotta get out of the house now, I have a meeting, I've gotta pick up the kids, I've gotta write that paper, I've gotta be at that Divine Compassion Conference. You know, is God present? Yes, of course he is, we know that. But we have to go through those steps to get where we need to go to be able to see clearly, to break through distractions. And one, of, one distraction I just want to focus a little bit that stands in the way today for a lot of us is not just the computer, but our cell phones. And so I dare say that when my husband is blessing houses, he does bless the computer, he blesses the toys, he blesses the plants, and he does bless the technology because, while these are all wonderful and help us to accomplish our work, they're, you know, face time needs to be in the presence of the other. It's great to text to say we're coming late, it's great to text to say where are you, but unless we cultivate the relationships around us, we can't have healing either. And for some of us, we're so distracted with the email, the the texting, that what's happened now, according to statistics, is that in the dating world, in our culture, that they don't even know where they stand with one another because they aren't having real relationships. The relationships are based on texts, emails, and phone calls, and we don't even understand the nature or the quality of what we're experiencing with one another. So we don't have that knowledge of truth in the relationship. So, so we have to stop doing that and be present and tough out the difficulty of actually talking to one another, of being present and having conversations and spending time together. That's the old fashioned way and that's what the church does. We, we can't just have Jesus to go. We don't just come in line for communion. We come to church and we right? I want Jesus to go. I do, of course, but I, I want to be bathed and wrapped in the holiness of his saints. And that's what we are, that's what we have. So all I'm saying about that whole healing piece is that we already have it. The healing is present. But it's, we won't know it unless we attend to it. Let us attend. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. It's no accident that the liturgy says peace, 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 because we're so distracted with everything, we can't know peace. No peace, we know, don't know Christ, we can't receive the healing. In that peace and in that knowledge of our own understanding, pride, self-love and vain glory. Our, our prayers should weed those out. The prayer that comes to mind that I want to share with you, two lines, Dee Pennock in her book, Path to Sanity, and you've heard that one. Beautiful, beautiful book. Lord Jesus Christ, deliver me from pride and give me self-knowledge. And Lord Jesus Christ, deliver me from self-justification and show me my sin. In the relationships at home, especially being a parent, we see in our children many times when we try to correct them that they don't want to take blame. There's always, it's always somebody else's fault. I didn't do that. I didn't know. I didn't take that toy out. Well, as adults, we do the same thing. Well, he didn't listen to me. No, he's not listening to me. Oh, he doesn't want to hear what I have to say. We all want to connect. We all want to have kinomia. But it may not be in the way that it's given to us and the way that we want it. And so in order to have that, we need to understand our part in that. And we need to take responsibility and not blame the other for what's wrong or what's happening to us. So part of that forgiveness would be, I forgive myself for not being perfect and not knowing how to do that. I, in that forgiveness, seek the help that is needed through my priest, through my family, through my friends, through a professional psychologist, through self-help programs, through the neighbor, however it is that God gives you to work that out, that forgiveness and then move forward with that. Because we're not gonna get there without that community support. The hardest part of healing relationships for us, I understand and believe, 
is to forgive those who hate us, those who wrong us, and those who we perceive as our enemies. But the Lord tells us clearly in Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 29, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. And to him who smites you on the one cheek, offer also the other. Hard to hear, what does it mean? For some of us, that means not being present to our enemies in person, but it means keeping a healthy boundary of distance and praying from afar, to love my enemy from afar and to offer them on the altar of Christ and say, they're yours, I can't do this, I ask for the healing. And not because I understand it, and not because they need healing, but because in my offering them to Christ, in my giving them back, and my praying for him or her, in my loving them in that way, I will be healed. I will have the grace of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will bless them. The church teaches us, rather than resenting those who wrong us, we're to love them and express this love by blessing and praying for them. We are commanded to do so for our own sake and for our own salvation, because he loves us, and we do it not for our own sake, but for our Lord, because we love him. But our fallen nature rebels against this. What? Bless and pray for the person who wronged me? Yes. For Christ's sake, we go against our fallen nature and force ourselves to pray. The kingdom is taken by force. That's what that means. It's taken by force. We ask God to bless and have mercy on the person who hurts us and wish good things for him. Menetios Weber says, the only way we're going to get out of the past and out of the future and stay present is to crucify the mind. Because what happens? We can't turn it off, even when we have dreams. Fun dreams, wonderful dreams, scary dreams, and nightmares. We realize that the mind is continually working. So the fighting against the evil and coming into conformity with the kingdom of God and being present before him is a continual daily, sometimes every minute, every hour, crucifixion of the mind to stand before him and say, I can't take her one more second. I give her to you. I ask you to forgive me. I am in competition with her. She thinks she's all that. Make a prayer. Get out of the head. Get into the heart. And I promise you that's what I do. So part of the healing for that, I extend you at home in raising children in the faith and raising a husband <laughs> in the faith is to we are, as St. John Chrysostom says, the little church. So is not our family the church itself? So, you have iconas at home, you have vigil lights, light them. The first thing you do is you hit the floor, thank God, get up, light your candles. And when you're home, be before them. They're your friends. That's the kingdom. You know, you don't have Susie or Mary or Bob or Dave there, but you've got Theotokos, you've got St. Herman, you've got St. Raphael, I've got St. Ephrosianos. I home school my kids, I'm in the kitchen. The desk is there, and Father works from home. You better believe I'm praying for those people, because I need them. And I come before them, and I say, really? Seriously? And I, I'm being funny, but I'm being serious with you. That This is what we're called to do. And I, I'm outside of the church building, but I'm in the presence, not of my enemies, but the table fully laden with my friends, and I call on them. So, as St. Porphyrius says, before you scold the child, Talk to Panagia, talk to Christ, ask for the words, because, because I don't know what they need. It's my anger, my expectation, my lack of knowledge that is the problem here. And if the grace is to extend, if the healing is to happen in the relationship, I gotta give them back to God. He gave me them, my husband and my children, for my salvation. And they, as St. Herman says, are my joy and my resurrection. I often say, they are my cross. But the church says, our cross is our joy. So I extend to you that that healing has to be continual crucif crucifixion of the mind and the remembrance of God, as St. Metropolitan College just said, at all times. You know, it's hard, it's painful, but the prayer must be. I want to just, another real life example to share to you, um, was very blessed to see the movie Saving Mr. Banks. See Saving Mr. Banks? 
I didn't know, you know, I love Emma Thompson, I love Tom Hanks, I love movies, but I don't always watch the movies because I thought, you know. But my, my husband invited me, and in looking at this beautiful movie of uh, the author of Mary Poppins, whose uh, life was very painfully marked with the loss of her father, who was an alcoholic, who loved her dearly, who uh, made her feel like there was no one else in her li in his life but her, and he saw her beauty, he encouraged her, and she had a really beautiful relationship with him when he was there, but then he died. And she wrote The Mary Poppins, and Disney sought out to uh, make a movie because his children were in love with Mary Poppins and the story, but for 20 years he sought her and she would not relinquish the rights for him to write the movie. What is so beautiful and so tender to me is to see a man, Disney, Disney, who courted her for all that long and did not give up. In the very last part of the movie is my favorite part because he is not being angry through the movie with her not giving in to him, but rather he tries every angle. He extends what in the church we know naturally to be philoxenia, hospitality. He makes it as easy as possible for her to be comfortable, and she still can't do it. In the very end, they're just about to sign, and she gives up and goes home. Well, I can imagine not only his anger and frustration, but his sense of defeat and loss. For 20 years, he finally had her and didn't get her. So he flies home to her home, leaving Los Angeles, goes to England, and he shows up at her door, and she's surprised to see him. He asks for tea. She gives it to him. And she says, you've come here to change my mind, haven't you? He says, oh, no, no, no. I haven't come to change your mind. I've come because you have misjudged me. And she says, how, how do I misjudge you? And he says, that you thought that I wanted Mary Poppins just to add to my kingdom and make myself wealthier and, you know, add another notch to my belt. And she said, well, haven't you? And he said, no. If that's all it was, he said, I would not have spent 20 years pursuing you. And she said, Mary Poppins isn't real. And he said, she's real to me and she's real to a lot of people. And he says, I'm sorry because I hoped that this would be a magical experience for you and for all of us, but it hasn't been. So he takes the high road. Instead of her saying, I'm sorry, this has been painful for me. I can't do this. I don't know why. And thank you for all you've done. And why don't you just go home and leave me alone? But she couldn't. She couldn't see what she put him through. He could see what he put her through. But the reason he could see also what he needed to do was he had the clarity of understanding himself because in the next scene, or the same scene, the next words he says to her is that, I understand you. Mary Poppins and the, that book is very dear to you. It's your life, and you don't want to entrust it to me. It's all you know to be true and near and dear to your heart, and you can't trust me. You're, you're thinking that I'm not going to do right by you. And he says, but I want to tell you that I also have a family. And he goes on to tell her about his life and his suffering. <laughs> and she understands that it's not always been happy for him. He hasn't always been rich and wealthy. But he worked real hard with a father who worked him really hard. But the best part, as he tells her, is he says, I love my father. He goes, this is true about my life. But I don't want to remember my father that way. He was a truly wonderful man, and I want to remember him that way. Don't you want to remember your father that way? And she says, I don't need to forgive my father. He was a wonderful man. He said, no, you need to forgive yourself because you couldn't save him from his own death. And it was in that reality of understanding that she spent her whole life clinging to the sadness of the fact that she could not save her father from dying that prevented her from living in the, in the present, from going to the future, and being who she is. It was when she understood that Walt Disney understood her 
and respected her and could relate to her, that she could let her guard down and she felt the divine compassion and the mercy to be able to enter into an honest relationship with him and be able to move forward. And I just leave you with that image. And if you haven't seen the movie, please go see it because it is very healing. And I ask for you to take from this what you need and to ask God, what do I need to do to heal the relationship in my life that are painful for me, that the people I don't love, and the people that are my enemies, and ask for the grace to pray for those things. Thank you. Thank you.